message that I really am excited to preach tonight. But uh, people are making fun of me lately because of a certain pose. And the pose that they're making fun of me for is this. And uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense until you see why. So they're going to pass some stuff out. I, go ahead, guys. You can pass. I, I have something for you because these are going up all over Indonesia. In about two weeks, they start. And I have the smaller handbills that are going out to 30,000 different people. And I just want you to take that and pray for us during those, uh, those dates that we're going to be there. And uh, so a lot of people are asking me kind of what's happening. We're getting ready to go into Indonesia uh, with uh, Pastor Peter and, uh, and the crew. And uh, Mikey's actually going with me. And so Mikey and I will be with Pastor Peter for a couple days. And then uh, Mikey's actually going in all by himself, an hour and a half away, just him, a translator, and a motorcycle. And they're going in ahead of time to set everything up, so pray that uh, Mikey's okay. He will be because of his good looks, I'm sure. And, uh, but if you're wondering, what in the world does this thing say? Because it's like, I can't read it except for the word festival in September. But other than that, you know, what does this thing say? Essentially, this is our promotion, and it means uh, friendship festival. And down here, you'll see it's the same as yours. It says, the blind will see. The deaf will hear, the lame will walk, because we go in and we just know that God is going to show up and do some incredible things with people, whether they're uh, Muslims or Hindus or belong to tribal religions. We go in, we present the gospel, and then the way that Jesus heals them is absolutely incredible. So we're going to be doing that in just a few short weeks. It's like six weeks away. And uh, be praying for us, because we're actually going in, we're renting out a field, a big speaker system, stage, and, uh, you know, we're believing for at least 10,000 people to show up in a town that is really not even 10,000 big. And so we're going out into the jungle areas to get these postcards out to people. The cool thing about it is 92% of the population in the city that we're going to has never heard of the name of Jesus before, and 99.9% of them are Muslims. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to see Jesus do some cool things. So be praying for us. That's coming up in six weeks. But I have a message tonight I believe is going to be awesome for you. It's called Toss Her Out. And so if you're sitting next to a lady that you love, this message does not mean to go home and to throw them out on the curb. I'll get into what it means. But the message, Toss Her Out. So I, I just want to ask, are you guys cool if I get a little bit, a little bit edgy tonight? Is that all right? Are you okay with that? Are you okay if I get a little bit fired up? Because I, I, I really believe that, that the Lord is going to speak something here. Because when I was in Burma, it blew my mind to see Buddhists and Muslims run up and on the platform, them saying, Jesus healed me, I was blind, now I see. Jesus healed me, I was deaf, and now I could hear. Or the guy that was on a bed, and they brought him in, and he was on a bed for eight years, and he couldn't move and they bring him in, and he was a Muslim guy, and he ran up to the front. Obviously, Jesus must have healed him if he ran off the bed. And he runs up to the stage shouting, Jesus healed me. And the whole crowd went bonkers. And so it got me thinking, you know, I want to see that same thing happen right here in North America. Would you like to see that? Would you like, because Jesus isn't any different there than he is here. And so this whole message is what I have learned over the past 15 months that I really believe is the reason that we see Jesus do so many things over in places of Africa and Asia, and he wants to do the same exact thing here. And so I'm going to preach this message that totally changed my life, and I hope it does something for you. And so I'm just going to start off by just reading through what happens when the gospel is presented. And so this whole message, I'm going to lay a little bit of a foundation and then I'm going to go a little bit ham at the end. Don't worry. And so here's what it says. We're going to start off with 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And this is uh, Apostle Paul speaking. He says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. And my message and my preaching were not with wise or persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So, so well, when I see this, I see that the Apostle Paul is saying that when the gospel is preached, it shouldn't come with human wisdom or it shouldn't be the focus of eloquence, but it should be a demonstration of God's power. And there's something so simple about preaching the gospel 
and then asking Jesus to show up. And that's what happens when, when we go overseas is, is we don't have these big, deep messages. We literally sit there, stand there in front of thousands of people, and we preach Jesus and what he did for us. And then all of a sudden we just say, Jesus, we've presented your gospel. Now show up and heal people. And they get healed by the hundreds with no one laying hands on them. And it's because of the simplicity of who Jesus is. And so I just want to get into this to, because I think sometimes along the way we can get so bogged down with every different thing. We can get so bogged down with the areas of life that we forget the simplicity of the gospel. And so what ends up happening here is we see a couple of things. We see that in verse 2 he says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus and him crucified. I think this is pretty important. Apostle Paul is saying that he could preach about anything. And he preaches one thing, and one thing alone, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why is that? Because there's complete, total victory in what Jesus has done. When he died on the cross and rose again from the grave, it's not a, a victory that's coming. It's not a victory that, that might come, that's in the process. It's in a victory that's already been won. Jesus has paid the way for us. He has died, risen again. He has saved us, healed us, set us free, done, finished, in the past. Nothing else needs to be added. That's why Apostle Paul says, I have resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ. Because there's power in the name of Jesus. There is power when Jesus is lifted up and when nothing else matters. Because when Jesus is lifted up, that's the only person that people are looking at. That's the only name people are worried about. And that is when the healings and the freedom happen. When Jesus and Jesus alone is lifted up. And what's up happening here is we see Apostle Paul says, my message and my preaching were not with wise or persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. With a demonstration of the Spirit's power. I don't know about you, but I want to see this every time the body of Christ gathers. I, I want to see Jesus' Spirit and it demonstrated by power. It is the promise that we have when we preach Jesus and we lift him up, is that when we lift up Jesus, there's nothing else that can happen except for the power of the Spirit to move. So that means when Jesus is lifted up, healings happen because Jesus brings healing. It means that when Jesus' name is lifted up, that freedom happens because freedom is found in the presence of Jesus. And it's so simple, yet we've made it so complicated. Like, like think about how complicated we've made it. Like, I I've used to read books that would say, here's eight steps to healing. And the eight steps to healing were nothing but to give the guy that wrote the book some money. Because the eight steps were complete garbage because the only thing you need to know about healing is Jesus died for healing and Jesus heals today. Like, that's not eight steps. That's one thing that Jesus did. So, so, so why am I worried about the eight, 12, 15 steps to, to a new, better life? There is really no step except to know Jesus and, and know Jesus alone. And so it's the simplicity of the gospel that changes lives. It's the simplicity of it. And so it got me thinking about it. What is the true gospel. Because I think there's a lot of not true gospels running around. And, and the true gospel is really quite simple. I'm not going to go to the verse, but you can go to Ephesians chapter 2 a little bit later. But the verse, or, or, or the, the, the gospel is really this. We were dead in our transgressions. Jesus came for us. He freed us. He, he, he loved us. And now he's given us a purpose. And that purpose is to take the demonstration of the Spirit's power to those that haven't experienced it. It's that simple. And so, there's two things that I think that we do that really limit our ability to receive from Jesus. There's two ways that we always overcomplicate. Are you ready for these? Who came in needing Jesus to do something in their life? Anyone? Okay, okay so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint this picture. The first thing that we do is we like to focus on the enemy or the devil and his power. So, so, so we, we, we love to focus on it. I mean, I used to love to focus on it. I mean, there was nothing more exciting than reading books about demons to me. I just got so excited. Call me weird, but you can call me weird, but you know it's true for so many other people. It's just like fascinating. It's like, ooh, how are we going to overcome the enemy? Ooh, we got to do this thing because like, if we can overcome him, then all of a sudden we can overcome what's coming up against us. 
this is where we overcomplicate it because do you know that you're fighting a battle that doesn't even exist anymore? Like we spend our whole lives fighting a battle that doesn't even exist. Look, like, I, I don't know if there's a battle to you, but I don't see that there's a battle because in Colossians 2.15, it says, When he, being Jesus, had disarmed the rulers and authorities, those supernatural forces of evil operating against us, he made a public example of them, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal possession, having triumphed over them on the cross. Leave it up there for a minute. It says, when he had disarmed. When he had disarmed. It doesn't say when he's disarming. It doesn't say he's currently disarming. It doesn't say that he will disarm in the future. It says that when he had disarmed. That means that the enemy has no power in your life when you recognize who Jesus is. When Jesus is lifted up. And then it says that he triumphed over him on the cross. Not that he is going to triumph. Not that he is triumphing. That past, sealed, done, it is finished. He triumphed over them. You see, we, we, we want to make it so much about the enemy when the enemy is already defeated. So, 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 so what does that mean? It means Jesus Christ has already paved the way for your healing, for your freedom, for the best life that you could ever imagine. It's found in nothing else other than knowing Jesus. That is one way that we oversimplify it or, or that we overcomplicate it. The second way so people might get a little mad at me because I used to do this a lot. The second way is on our mindset of how life works or how to connect and receive from Jesus. So I'm going to get into this a little bit. I hope, I hope you get something out of this. I believe you will. If you don't, I'm leaving Friday morning, so you can, you can come after me. That's fine. And so this is what it says. It says this in Galatians Chapter 4, verses 21 through 5-1. I'm going to read through it, and then we'll break it down a little bit. It says, the scriptures say that Abraham had two sons. First off, I want to stop and say, I have an unhealthy obsession with Abraham. Most of you know that because I think when I was here, I preached out of a tent about 14 times the same message because I was always making myself happy preaching it, and I still do. I've preached it three times in Canada already. And it says that the scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn was born of God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, what a bummer of a name, represents Mount Sinai where people received the law and enslaved them. And how Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in Arabia because she and her children live in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She's a free woman, and she is a mother. And it says, and you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaac. But you are now being persecuted by those who want to keep the law, just as Ishmael, the children born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the children born by the power of the Spirit. But what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. So Jesus Christ has, free, has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. So at first glance, this doesn't look like a whole lot because we're like, well, we're not Jewish, so we're not really doing the law. Like there really is no law today, we're free. But I beg to differ a little bit. I, I, I think that a lot of us get caught up in this having to do certain things to connect and to receive from Jesus. So I, I, I see a lot, and I used to do this. Like you could ask people that were around at Elevate for years, I, I would preach like these things. And, and I realized that, that, that I believe God showed up and moved because of mercy and grace. But, but, but I believe that not all of it was right on because we really don't have to do anything because Jesus has already done it. And, and so what ends up happening here is I, I want to share with you in just the next few short minutes what I have realized and what, I, what has popped out at me as far as being free and experiencing Jesus to the fullest all the time. And so we see this in this that 
that there's two different battles going on here. And we're just going to break down a few of these verses. The first one is I want to look at Galatians 4, 22 through 24. It says, the scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from the freeborn. And the son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two serve as an illustration of the two covenants. There's two different mindsets here. The first one, if you notice, it equates, it doesn't say the law, it says humans attempt of the fulfillment of the promise. My real question for you is, if you've been asking God to do something for a long time, how, how much have you been beating yourself up trying to make it happen? Are you tired of it already? I, I mean, so, like, we can do all these things and we can wonder, God, why aren't you doing it? And maybe there's something wrong with me, and, and I've got to do this and do that. And, 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 and we spend so much time to just trying on our own to make it happen. Like, like, we just try so hard. Like, I'm not saying that hard work is not good. In fact, without hard work, nothing good is going to happen. But what I am saying is there's a difference between hard work and trying to do everything on your own. Just this, just this idea that, that I have to do this, 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 and this for, for God's fulfillment of the promise. And in all reality, when we're doing that, we're saying, God, you're not good enough to be God on your own. You need me to help you. And so, and so what ends up happening here is, is we get so caught up in this, in this trying to position ourselves in the right place at the right time under the right circumstance for Jesus to look on us and say, today's your day. And it gets tiring and exhausting. It is brutal and not fun. And in the middle of all that, if you're like me, you're just like, this, is, this can't be right. But then there's the other mindset. And the other mindset says that it's God's own fulfillment of his promise of grace. So, so we see that there's human effort, and then there's grace. Grace doesn't make sense. Grace doesn't make sense that, that God would just uh, be there and fulfill his promise on my life because, because of who he is, no, no, no matter wh what's going on with me. It doesn't make sense. We're, 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 if we're honest, which of the two are we a little bit attracted to? I'm attracted to human effort. You, you, you can judge me if you want. I'm so attracted to human effort. Why? It makes me feel good when something good happens because of what I did. Like, like we, we feel like we're part of what God's doing. Like we feel like we get to be a part of this thing. Like, like, like I, I, I fought that battle on my own, and I, look at me right now. And then, oh, like, like I'm going to fight it so that I can help other people fight it. That's the mindset that I have. But that's not the mindset that Jesus has. The mindset of Jesus is God's own fulfillment of the promise instead of human effort. I want you to think about the thing that you've been asking God to do, the, the, the healing that you're believing for, the, 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 the freedom that you're asking for. Well, what is it that you're believing God to do? And you have worn yourself out time and time again with the human effort of trying to make a promise happen, and it seems to not be happening. So that didn't work, so we're going to try something else. And that didn't work, so we're going to try something else. I, I don't know about you, but it's tiring, it's exhausting, and I'm done with it. And then, there's the fulfillment of God's own promise. The two differing views. When you take the view that God will fulfill it because he said it, and there's nothing I have to do to make God fulfill his own promise, that's when God fulfills his promise in your life. And so what ends up happening here is, is, but we're attracted to the one. We're so attracted to the one. So, so, so what, is the, what does the Apostle Paul say here? He, he says this. In, uh, in, 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 in verse 29, I'm getting so excited, I'm stuttering like a fool. It says this. It says, but you are now being persecuted by those who want to keep the law, just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born of the, the power of the Spirit. 
whenever you believe God to show up and to fulfill his promise, you're going to have those people come around and say, you need to do this, that, this and that, and they're going to try to push human effort on you because human effort always tries to supersede what God is doing. This is what the Paul says. And so you, we have to understand that when we believe God will fulfill his own promise in our life, that grace has come for us, his name is Jesus, when we believe that, people will come against us because they say, well, you have got to do this and that to receive from Jesus. And so we were consumed with the two different varying viewpoints. Has anyone ever thought this before? Maybe I'm preaching to myself, and that's cool if I am. But what ends up happening is it's exhausting and it's brutal. So I've come here tonight to tell you this one thing. What it says in Galatians 4.30. I believe this is when people do this. I believe healings, freedom, the thing you believe in God for will happen. And I believe it'll happen tonight. Because it says this. But what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman. So what does it say? Get rid of the slave woman. What does that mean? Get rid of the human effort. Get rid of trying to do it on your own. That, that's what I mean by toss her out. You know what you got to do? You got to take the human effort, and, and, and sooner or later you'll get to the point, but I'm hoping it's tonight, that you just toss it out because it doesn't work biblically. You guys got to toss it out. You toss out the regulation. You toss out all the things you got to do. You toss it out, and you trust in the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus that already did it, that already paid the way, that already freed you, that already healed you, that already made grace available to you, you toss out the slave woman of human effort and embrace all that Jesus has already done because he has already done it. It is finished. And so we like to hold on to the human effort. We like to hold on. Those of you that have been around long enough and you remember me when I was nine years ago or something, I think it was. Nine years ago, I started believing a promise that I believe God spoke to me, which was that I would preach in front of mass crowds. I did everything that I could possibly do to make it happen. I remember sitting in, a, in an office at 2 o'clock in the morning, designing this stupid logo for this awful name of something that was terrible called Solution Revolution, the most awful name for anything you could ever imagine, making letters and signing them out, and I got no one to respond. I tried time and time and time again to make a promise happen. I, I couldn't do it. And when I finally gave up on trying to make it happen and asked Jesus to do it, it wasn't much longer that everything happened. And then once I got to Canada, then all of a sudden, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't really spend a whole lot of time with Pastor Peter. I, you know, see him and, hey, how's it going? And I would get all excited when, you know, he invite me over to swim in the pool or you know, it was just like, ooh, this is exciting, right? And thing after thing after thing happened, but I gave up trying. And I allowed God to do his thing. Little did I know that a year into being in Canada, Pastor Peter would ask me to come move up to his house. And, and, and I see him and I have dinner with him like four or five times a week. And, 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 the, and the very thing that, that God spoke to me that I tried to make happen so much on my own, all of a sudden when I just trusted Jesus, and it's hard to trust Jesus sometimes, I get it. Like we, we all want to do something because it feels a little helpless when you don't. And all of a sudden when I got to the point that I allowed God to be God, then he started making stuff happen. My question for you tonight is, are you willing to throw out the slave woman of human effort to accept what Jesus Jesus is. 
And, 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 and Jesus sums it all up by what Paul says in Galatians 5.1. The very next verse, he says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't go back to that old life. Don't go back to human effort. Don't go back to the rituals. Don't go back to thinking you have to do something. Don't go back to thinking you have to add to what Jesus has already done. He says, now truly stay free and don't go back. Because there's a tendency to go back. I say all that to say that this is why I believe people get healed nonstop all across the world is because the simplicity of Jesus preached. The simplicity of Jesus is able and nothing else matters in that moment. If you came into the room tonight, I want you to know that nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what the doctors say. It doesn't matter what people have said. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't even matter what, what, what so-called, and I believe in prophecy, so I'm not knocking it, but it doesn't matter what all the different prophetic voices say. What matters is Jesus has said in his word, you are healed. And Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he healed then, he heals now. Nothing else matters in the moment. If you came in needing freedom, nothing else matters other than the fact that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It doesn't matter what people tell you in coaching sessions or in this or in that. All that matters in the moment is what Jesus says to you right here and right now. And his word says, you are healed, you are free, you are the head and not the tail, you are above and not beneath. That's what he says. That is all that matters is what Jesus says. And I say all that to say there's some people tonight that I know Jesus is going to show up and bring some healing. There's going to be some people that experience freedom. And so some of the worship team can go to come on up. I know it's a little bit short, but we're going to pray and we're going to see some miracles and then we're going to put together some backpacks. But there's some people in the room that need Jesus to do something in their life. I want you to know he's here tonight. He's here. We don't have to ask Jesus to show up right now because he's already here right now. With two or three of us gathered, he's there. And so we know that when Jesus is here, he wants to show up. And so if you need a healing in your body, you need freedom in some area, I want you to just pop up on your feet where you're at. And then I want you to come forward, if that's you. And Jesus is your people, come forward. I ask that you would show up like only you can, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you are the healer. That you are the one that sets free. And so, Jesus, your gospel was preached tonight, and so I ask that you would heal your people tonight. All across this room, if you need a healing in your body, in your physical body right now, lift your hands up to heaven right now. I'm going to pray for you. In the name of Jesus, we take authority over every sickness, every disease, and every malformity. We speak to every spirit of infirmity. And we say, in the name of Jesus, come out! And be healed now, in Jesus' name. Now move your part of the body around like it's been hurting you. Move it around right now. Move it around right now. Jesus, we thank you for healing. saying, you know what? Jesus just healed me right now. Raise your hand where you're at. Jesus just healed you right now. 
Mike, Mike, you find out what happened here. Find out what happened here. There's, there's some other people in the room. You're saying, I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is for me. There's several people in the room with knee issues. Knee issues. Who, who, who is that with knee issues? Right, if, you have knee, if you have knee issues, come up to the front right now. Come up to the front right over here. I'm going to pray for you. I, I, like, like run to the front like you've already been healed. Because when Jesus reveals it, he heals it. So, so, so just come up. Just come, if that's knee issues, right up to the front. Right up to the front right now. Jesus, we thank you for healing her in your name. Jesus, we thank you for healing. We thank you for healing. The knee is healed now in Jesus' name. We thank you for it. Jesus, we thank you that the knee is healed now in your name. We thank you for it, Jesus. We thank you for it. We thank you for the healing. We thank you for the healing now in Jesus' name. Jesus, we thank you for healing her now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. If that's you that had a knee issue, just begin to move it around a little bit right now. Begin to move it around. Move it around like you haven't been able to move it before. Move it around like you haven't been able to move it before. If that's you and you're saying, you know what? There's healing in my knee right now. Just give me a wave. Just give me a wave if you feel the healing. You feel the healing. All right, we have some people that feel the healing. Mikey, do we have a, we have a testimony? Bring them up if we have a testimony. Bring them up. We have, there's, there's someone else that there's severe range of motion issues in the right arm. In the right arm. I want to pray for you. Who is that? Who is that that has that? All right, come on up with that. Come up. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. While they're coming up, tell us what happened. Okay, I've been having this rash and itching uh, for three weeks. I've been to the doctor twice, and it just hasn't gotten any better, and it's gotten worse. It stopped itching. That is awesome, is it not? So, 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 who healed you tonight? Jesus. That is good stuff. So Jesus healed you. That is healed you. Who else has been healed tonight? Who, who else can say I, I'm physically? I can feel that I'm healed tonight. Anyone else knows that it's already happened? Just give me a wave if that's you. Give me a wave if that's you. All right. So we have the we have the right arm, right? So Jesus, we thank you that that right arm is healed. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. We thank you for it. Right arm issue. Jesus, we thank you. He said both arms. Jesus, we thank you. Let's begin to move it around. Begin to move it around. Begin to move it around. Jesus, we thank you for full range of motion coming back. Go ahead and move your arms around. Move your arms around. Big like windmills. Big windmills. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for complete healing in this arm. Jesus. I can feel what's happening here. And we need a creative miracle, of Lord. So Jesus, we speak that creative miracle in Jesus' name. We thank you for that creative miracle. We thank you for it. We thank you for it in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, there's some people in the room that you have severe headaches and it's actually going on right now. But who is that with the severe headaches? Is there anyone else with the severe headaches too? Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for healing Pastor Patty right now. And in Jesus' name, we say you are healed. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. Jesus, we thank you for healing the headaches in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. We thank you for it. If you're in the room and you've experienced healing and you want to share what Jesus has done, just come up because I believe Jesus is doing a lot in this room right now. And there's someone else in the room that, that you're having walking issues. It's like it's hard to stay on balance. It's like the balance is off while you're walking. If that's you, just raise your hands where you're at. I'm going to pray for you. See your hand there. See your hand over there. See your hand there. See your hand there. See your hand there. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for balance coming back and for gait to be stable. And so, Jesus, we thank you for healing now in Jesus' name. We thank you for healing now in Jesus' name. This is a word that I believe is from the Lord. 
And that is this, that just as you've witnessed so many different people come through and pray for miracles and see them happen, the same is for you. That when you pray for people, that the miracles would happen. Because it's the same Holy Spirit that lives in me, that lives in someone else, that lives in you. And if you've been having a little bit of fear to believe God to show up when you pray for the miraculous, just raise your hands. I'm going to pray for that fear and anxiety to go. Jesus, we thank you for every hand that is raised, that you've called them and everyone in the room to lay hands on the sick and they would recover, to speak to illnesses and they would be healed. Jesus, we thank you that in Mark 16 it says that every sickness would go and the demons would be cast out where we go because of you, Jesus. And so Jesus, I pray for boldness and that fear and anxiety and worry would go when we step out to move in you, Jesus. We thank you for freedom across this place. In your name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. Jesus is awesome, isn't he? Now, I mean, is Jesus awesome in this place? One thing I want to say before I hand the microphone back over is this. There is a city out there that needs to know Jesus. It, it, it doesn't need another church program. It, it, it doesn't need another great revelation. It needs you that know Jesus to take Jesus everywhere that you go to lay hands on the sick and to see them recover, that they would experience his power and his love right there where they're at. And I believe that it's here. And I, I, I believe that there's a group of people right here in this church that God has given you Cleveland to do something incredible. Does anyone believe that in this place? Jesus, we thank you for it. We thank you for what you've spoken over this place. We thank you for, for what you're doing. And Jesus, we ask that you would take ordinary people like us to reach your city with the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for going with us because you live within us. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.